Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Catholicism. Today, I'm here with Eric Yabara of Classical Christian Thought. Eric, it's great to have you on again. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing excellent, Suan. Thank you for having me on. It's it's a, it's a blast to be back. Now, uh, our friend of ours, Gavin Ortland, has posted a video recently on a challenge to Vatican I, and he's looking at not only Pope Vigilius, but a lot of just even, you know, I noticed that I think three-fourths of the video was just looking at Vatican I and really uh, stressing, let's say, how grandiose the claims are. Is that a fair characterization? Yes, I got that too. And, and um, you know, he gave a lot of extra information about just the, the general historical untenability is what I got um, of, sure. of Vatican I, yeah. Right. And, you know, uh, I was thinking about recommending the video that you did on my channel, you know, Vatican I in the first millennium, where you talked about Pope Hadrian, uh, other videos that other people have done. But I wanted to focus on one thing really quick before we go into your presentation and responding to Gavin Ortland, which was uh, when, you know, whenever somebody mentions Vatican I saying and Pastor Eternus, you know, it was known in every age, right? I think it just always needs to be mentioned that it is quoting the Council of Ephesus in 431 AD. And if you, if one believes that what was going on in Vatican I with Pastor Eternus, right, that quotation, that block, you know, it was known in every age that uh, Peter rules through successors, all that. If you think that is papal supremacy and papal infallibility and the Vatican I claim, and that was made in 431 AD at the Council of Ephesus, then you have an example of Vatican I ecclesiology in the first millennium, you know? So I don't know how, what you do with that, but Eric, what are your thoughts there? Um, I, I think you just did my whole presentation in, in, in five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, uh, I, I did the spark notes version, right? You're going to give the, the fuller uh, dissertation length uh, defense, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I'm going to try to go fast. I promise you in the audience. <laughs> well, Eric, I'm ready for your presentation. All right, so let me go to share my screen, and let me know as soon as you begin to see. Yep, uh, I see it. You see it. Okay, so now I'm going to go to slideshow and show from the beginning. All right, so um, this is uh, entitled uh, Pope Vigilius, and uh, wait, let me move this window so I can see. Uh, there you go. Pope Vigilius in Vatican I. A response to Dr. Gavin Ortland. Now, just as a uh, pr one preliminary remark here, um, you and I both are friends with Dr. Gavin Ortland. So everything I'm going to say in this uh, presentation is with the emphatic remark that this is all meant to be said in charity. And um, if uh, if Gavin in if Gavin would like to interact with me in private or on a show. Uh, about what I'm saying in this presentation, uh, then I'm I'm 100% open to that, and I'm also going to say that uh, this presentation is not just meant to be only a response to every word that uh, Gavin said, because I I'm going to have a little bit longer of a presentation than he, he had. I added some general stuff here about the topics he brought up, so I know sometimes we get annoyed if. Somebody does a video and then we do a response video that's like twice as long. Well, in this case, I'm 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 just adding things according to the topic. So it's not all Gavin. It's going to be just the general history. But in Gavin's presentation, which I think everyone should watch before watching this, um, it has four basic uh, claims in the first one here I have on the screen in the first millennium the Roman see enjoyed a general prominence prestige primacy of honor privilege and preeminence that's in minute 1811 however Gavin says it did not enjoy the status of supremacy and infallibility as defined by the councils of Vatican one and two second thing that of of the of the uh video Gavin did the general prominence of the Roman See in the first millennium was based upon the fact that the city of Rome was the historic capital of the empire, the dual apostolicity of both Saints Peter and Paul, and that the Roman church was a flagship bastion of orthodoxy for several centuries early on. Gavin says that in minute uh, 1859. 
The third point of the whole video is Vatican I's dogmatic constitution on papal authority is not an organic development that logically follows prior data in the first millennium, but is an alien accretion into the church as the result of centuries of power centralization and spontaneous developments that corrupted the earlier and more original Roman primacy. Even Catholic scholars such as Brian Tierney and Johann Ignaz von Dollinger admit this. And the fourth uh, part, which is going to finish this summation of Gavin's presentation, uh, is this. The historical event that took place at the Council of Constantinople II in 553 and its contention with Pope Vigilius serves to illustrate that councils were superior to popes, thereby challenging the Vatican councils, that's one and two, on papal supremacy. All right, so the structure of the presentation is going to basically go in this basic way. We're going to discuss the the uh, Gavin's issues on papal infallibility in history. Then we're going to talk about papal supremacy in history. Then we're going to go into the, the meat of the issue, which is uh, the Vigilius and uh, Constantinople 553. A preliminary remark, my second one, on the pre-Nicene papacy, because Gavin did talk about how Catholic apologists tend to stretch the data is the words that he used. And um, I want to say that 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 can happen. I know as an Anglican, when I was an Anglican and I was looking into the Catholic Church and I was in the online forum world back then, there was no I didn't use Facebook. I, I was just on forums. <laughs> um, and and I remember looking into the papal claims and I remember seeing what Gavin's seeing, like some of that stretchy stuff, just going from very uh, uh, like Peter was the head of the apostles to Vatican one. Obviously we don't want to do that here. So I want to say that Gavin, you know, it, it's, it's, it's good to mention. We shouldn't stretch, stretch the data um, on these issues. He mentioned uh, on the pre Nicene papacy, like St. Clement and his letter um, to Corinth or St. Ignatius's epistle to Rome or the mono episcopacy in Rome before 150 AD. Um, those issues I'm not going to address because it takes a long time to get into those things, and it's going to get us away from the meat of what I'd like to talk about. But if you want to see what I have to say about it, you could just uh, get my book, um, and I give a fair treatment, I am told anyway, even from non-Catholics, on those issues. Um, the Cyprian of Carthage one, again, I've got like, I don't know, 20 pages just devoted to Cyprian in my book. Um, which which I, I take it as an axiom that Cyprian sees each local church as uh, basically the throne of St. Peter. Uh, but I add the, the caveat with evidence from Cyprian and the contemporaries that the universal chair of Peter is in Rome, and that has a certain significance. But I won't be bringing it up in this presentation. So I do apologize to Gavin and those who might have been looking forward to that. Um, I'm going to have to move on. But like I said, tons more in my book. All right. So we're going to talk first about uh, one Catholic scholar that comes up quite a bit um, from Eastern Orthodox and Protestants. Um, they usually go right to this quote in, uh, in his book. And this is Dr. Brian Tierney, the late Dr. Brian Tierney, um, who was an ex outstanding medievalist scholar. Uh, but he said this, quote, the idea of infallibility did not emerge inevitably because it had always been presupposed. It was invented almost almost fortuitously because an unusual con concatenation of historical circumstances arose that made such a doctrine useful to a partic particular group of controversialists. Circumstances involving Jehoiamite radicalism, Franciscan spirituality, and the whole peculiar ambivalent relations between the Franciscan order and the papacy, close quote. That's page 274 in the famous book of his Origins of Papal Infallibility. Another quote that uh, Gavin gave in his presentation was, quote, Papal infallibility was invented in the first place by a few dissident Franciscans 
because it suited their convenience to invent it. So here you've got a Catholic medieval scholar who's immersed in the canonical literature of the early second millennium, who's saying that papal infallibility is basically an invention of the 13th century, the late 13th century at that. Um, so we're going to have, uh, we're going to look at this and see if Dr. Tierney's claims uh, hold up to scrutiny. The simple fact that I, I want to communicate here, because the Gavin said that um, we can dismiss the scholars Right. And, and typically, you know, um, some of these scholars who are saying things that go against Catholic teaching are dismissed by the people on the Internet. And I, I get it. I see that all the time. It does annoy me, too. Um, but Tierney is a unique case. And I think we're going to show that. OK, Tierney was extremely skeptical in his interpretation of historical texts on papal infallibility, so much so that he was even more skeptical than Protestant and Eastern Orthodox historians and theologians, both of which stand to benefit from anti-papacy evidence in the first millennium. If one wishes to see a clear exposition of Tierney's baffling and perplexing skepticism, one should read closely the peer review exchanges between Tierney and two other medieval historians, Father Alphonse M. Stickler and David L. D. Avre. For those of you who want to dive into this, you can pause the video here. This is all the stuff you need to read. But I want to say that uh, Dr. Tierney was an outstanding uh, medievalist uh, uh, scholar. I don't want to take that away from him. Um, so I want to say something here that he mentions in his good book, uh, The Foundations of the Conciliar Theory. Um, quote, this is, what he's, he, 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 this is what he's saying about the canonical um, tradition. Quote, for a medieval canonist, there could be no disputing about the constitution of the spiritual hierarchy itself. The government of the churches was by bishops, and the unity of the church was ensured by the communion of all its members with a single head, the papacy. So much was agreed, close quote. He also goes on to say, but within the bounds of that common doctrine, there was room for a variety of theories on the nature of the powers implied by the papal primacy. One, the relationship between Pope and Universal and on the internal structure of the Roman church itself. So Tierney recognizes that everyone in the canonical tradition going from the 11th century forward was in agreement that the divine, the divine constitution of the church is governed by bishops and the unity of those bishops was ensured by the communion of all of its members with the papacy. Now, for some reason, Tierney is very skeptical that a unique power of teaching should should repose in that principle of unity, which is is strange. Um, but he he basically holds the 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 logical. He's almost got the Rubik's cube solved here, um, but he he hesitates, and we'll see why in a little bit here. So the question is, but was papal infallibility invented? In the 13th century, that is the claim that Tierney wants to make. So I have a quote from Pope Innocent III from the 12th century. It goes like as, uh, as follows, quote, For if I myself am not solid in faith, how can I strengthen the faith of others? A responsibility which is known to pertain especially to my office, the Lord proclaiming, I have prayed for you, Peter, that your faith may not fail, and you, once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. What he prayed for, he received, since for his reverence he was heard in all things. And thus the faith of the apostolic see has never failed in any turbulence, but has remained always whole and undiminished. The privilege of Peter remains unbroken. Faith is so necessary for me, 
that whereas for other sins I have God alone as my judge, for a sin committed against faith, I can be judged by the church. For whoever does not believe is judged already. So here's a claim from the 12th century, which is unmistakably a matter of papal infallibility. This is a, one of those quotes that comes up um, in the Stickler Diavre correspondence with Tierney, which I think Tierney had no grounds to, to be skeptical. Tierney read this passage and said, eh, I still don't see papal infallibility. Uh, same Pope, a little bit earlier in his letter to John Kamar Kamaterus of Constantinople, he says, again, this is Pope to uh, the, the Constantinopolitan patriarch, quote, the Lord reveals that he had prayed for him, saying in the crisis of his passion, I have prayed for thee, Peter, that thy faith fail not, and thou being once converted, confirm thy brethren. By this signifying clearly that his successors would at no time ever deviate from the faith but would call others back, close quote. That's my citation there. Tierney read this as provided by D'Avre uh, and Stickler, and he's like, eh, I still don't see papal infallibility here. Tierney looks at Dictatus Papi, which uh, those of you uh, who are interested in this, this was a, a hot document, never, never was promulgated magisterially, but we know it was in the in the files of Pope Gregory the Seventh. Sorry, I have got Pope Gregory the Eighth there. That's Pope Gregory the Seventh in ten fifteen to ten eighty five. Uh, the twenty second point of the of the of the Dictatus says the Roman Church has never erred, nor will it err, to all eternity. Scripture being witness. Obviously, at the time, all the canonists and theologians knew it's talking about the the thrice ref, the thrice commission of Matthew, Luke, and John. Uh, but here, Tierney reads this and says this statement is inherently ambiguous. Close quote. That's uh, page twelve of the of the the book Origins of papal infallibility he finds it noteworthy a noteworthy distinction between possibly a roman ecclesial infallibility versus a papal personal infallibility so he's still digging his feet here on what this means <clears throat> tyranny emphasizes how luke 22 32 had more than one interpretation in the medieval canonical tradition this is true. However, others have made more probable interpretations of the popes before the 13th century. Dr. Agostino Paravicini Bagliani is a distinguished professor in medieval history who specializes in the history of the papacy. Besides receiving his professorship in 1978, he served as a scripter for the Vatican Apostolic Library and was professor of codicology at the Vatican School of Diplomatic and Archival Paleography. According to Bagliani, while Luke 2232's unfailing faith of Peter may have been read by some 12th century canonists as referring to the entire church, in his letter, and this is Bagliani's quote, in his letter of 1199, which we just read to the Patriarch of Constantinople, Innocent III interpreted the text from Luke more literally, and he tied together more tightly than they had been in the past the idea that Christ, in his prayers, had guaranteed the indefectibility of the faith of the universal church and the fact that Peter and his successors had never deviated and never would from the Catholic faith. That's from his book, The Pope's Body, page 68 to 69. So here's a great outstanding medievalist who's alive who would not have the kind of skeptical reading of Tierney. We're going to go a little bit earlier to a famous Pope, St. Leo IX, in his letter to Michael Carolarius. This is uh, the era, time that sparked that dreadful schism between Rome and Constantinople. Leo IX says the following, the Holy Church has been built upon a rock 
that is upon Christ. Let me just pause there. Uh, some Protestants and Orthodox who are reading this. Um, Leo the Ninth is right there in the zenith, top five of uh, the you know those who are emphasizing papal power, and he takes a Christocentric reading of Matthew sixteen. Anyway, let's get back to it. Um, the rock that is upon Christ and upon Peter, the son of John, who was first called Simon. It was so built because it never was to be conquered by the gates of hell. That is by heretical opinions, which lead the unwary to destruction. This is the promise of truth itself, who is the cause of all that is true. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The same Son of God bears witness that by his prayers he obtained the fulfillment of this promise from the Father. For he said to Peter, and here we go again, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, but I have prayed for you that your faith may fail not. Will there be anyone whose will is power to do can be devoid of effect? Is it not the see of the prince of the apostles, namely, by this Roman church, by by this St. Peter, and by his successors, that all the inventions of heretics stand condemned, exposed, and overcome? It's a rhetorical question. He goes on, are not the he are not uh are not the hearts of the brethren strengthened in the faith of Peter, which has not failed thus far? and will not fail till the end of time. That's my reference there. Tierney reads this and says, I just don't see papal infallibility. Okay. St. Bernard of Clairvaux, doctor of the church, says the following, quote, all the dangers and scandals that occur in the kingdom of God must be referred to the Holy See, but none more urgently than those which concern the faith. It is indeed just that any men any menace to the faith should be dealt with by the work by the one whose faith cannot falter. To whom else has it been said, I have prayed for thee? Here we go again. Peter, that thy faith fail not. The words that follow must apply to Peter's successor. And thou being once converted, confirm thy brethren. The time has come for you to acknowledge your primacy, to prove your zeal, and honor your ministry. Now, I see that my reference has been uh, jargled here. So I will I will send Suan my reference, and he'll put it in the show notes. We're going to go to St. Uh, Anselm of Canterbury. He says the following. Quote, for as much as the providence of God has chosen your holiness to commit to your custody the life and faith of Christians and the government of his church, to no other can reference be more rightly made. If so, be anything contrary to the Catholic faith arise in the church, that it may be corrected by his authority, nor to any other can anything which may be written against such errors be more safely submitted, nor to any other, nor to any other other that by his prudence it may be examined he also quotes and that's from his de fide trinitate famous document he wrote to the pope uh second the uh, second quote from saint anselm quote let those who despise the christian decrees of the vicar of peter and in him the decrees of peter and of christ seek for other gates of the kingdom of heaven for certainly they shall not enter in by those the keys of which the apostle peter bears that's to letter to hum bear um and, and i know gavin uh, has a special love for saint anselm so I, I i want him to take a special note of what what saint anselm wrote here i share the the affinity all right we're going to go to a hundred a couple hundred years before to pope saint nicholas the first and this is not just a quote mine this is actually a statement that one of the ecumenical councils absorbed as one of its own utterances OK, so this is what Pope Nicholas says, quote, the primacy of divine authority, which the creator of the universe bestowed on his chosen apostles, basing its solidity on the solid faith of the prince of the apostles, namely Peter. He resolved would lie in his preeminent, indeed, first see 
For by the Lord's voice it was said to him, You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Peter indeed, so named, from the firmness of the rock, which is Christ, does not cease so to protect with his prayers an unshaken structure of the universal church, fortified by the strength of the faith, that he hastens to correct the madness of those who stray from the rule of the Orthodox faith and bestows a reward on those who strengthen the church courageously so that in order that the gates of hell, that is the promptings of evil spirits and the attacks by heretics are unable to break the unity of the same church. Close quote. That's Pope Nicholas to Michael III in Constantinople. Tyranny reads this and says, I just don't see it. Well, you be the judge. Pope Agatho, this is going back 100, 200 years, almost precisely, uh, before Pope St. Nicholas. This is Pope Agatho, and this isn't a quote mine from the opinions of Agatho. This is a dogmatic epistle which was accepted and absorbed in a council. So it's the council's property. So I'm quoting an ecumenical council here. This is what the council says through uh, Agatha. Quote, for this is the rule of the true faith, which this spiritual mother of your most tranquil empire, the apostolic church of Christ, has both in prosperity and adversity always held and defended with energy, which it will be proved by the grace of almighty God has never erred from the path of the apostolic tradition. Just keep in mind, he's writing this in 680, which is about 130 years after the Vigilius event we're going to get into. Um, nor has she been depraved by yielding to heretical innovations, but from the beginning, that's when Peter founded the church in Rome or sustained and promoted the church at Rome. She has received the Christian faith from her founders, the princes of the apostles of Christ, and remains, that's a present tense to the future, and remains undefiled unto the end, according to the divine promise of the Lord. So that's a statement from the Sixth Ecumenical Council about the Sea of Rome. My citation is there. It's pretty much open to everyone who's got the internet. Um, but if you have volume 15 of the Nicene, post-Nicene Fathers, it's volume 15. Now, what do non-Catholic uh, historians and uh, Catholic historians who are of note uh, and who are reliable have to say about what Agatho wrote here. Father George Svolarovsky, perhaps the foremost theologian in the 20th century in, the Eastern, in Eastern Orthodox thought, wrote the following, at least in the English language. He wrote the following, quote, this lengthy letter by Pope Agatho to Emperor Constantine IV contains a full expression of the Roman primacy, a full expression of Rome's consciousness of its position in the church. Throughout, Pope Agatho interlaces the primacy of Rome and Rome's acceptance of the five holy ecumenical councils. Since the Apostolic See of Rome holds such a confession of faith, since the Apostolic See of Rome cannot err, no mention is made of Pope Honorius. Pope Agatho urges the emperor that this confession of of faith be accepted by the entire church that comes from his byzantine fathers of the fifth to eighth centuries um so florovsky doesn't believe in papal infallibility but he says that that's what agatho wrote um and there at the bottom i'm quoting carl joseph von heffele he's a catholic uh historical theologian back in the uh in the uh 19th century he said that pope agatho's letter read at the council repeatedly declares the infallibility of the Roman church. But when Brian Tierney reads Agatho, he's still, the, the needle's not moving. The needle doesn't move. You be the judge of that. According to Father Lauren Klinawerk, who's perhaps one of the finest Orthodox apologists in our day, um, again, in the English-speaking world, uh, he says Pope Agatho reaffirmed, which means that that's been affirmed in the past, reaffirmed Rome's traditional, rather than novel, 
traditional claim to Petrine infallibility. Now, Dr. Brian Tierney and many others look at a text like this and still show a remarkable sense of indecisive skepticism, so much so that his skepticism exceeds that of the great Protestant historian Philip Schaff, who's one of those that uh, Gavin has recommended, and, and, and he's good to do that. He's great. He's, everyone should read Philip Schaff. But this is what Philip Schaff says about Agatho's claims. Quote, it is also remarkable for the confidence with which it claims infallibility for the Roman church. Agatho quotes the words of Christ to Peter in favor of papal infallibility and anticipating, as it were, the Vatican decision of 1870. My, my, my. All right, we're moving on to an earlier figure before Agatho. Formula of Hormizdas and the Eastern Churches. Now, many of you have uh, heard about this. So I'm not going to quote this all. In, 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 But what I'm going to say is if you look at the bold, the claim that Hormizdas makes is that the promise of Matthew 18, 16, 18 is fulfilled because in the apostolic see the Catholic religion has always been preserved without stain. So in other words, Hormuzdas is claiming Matthew 16 as kind of like a prophetic utterance and the fulfillment of it is in the, in the, um, the, in, the inerrancy of the Roman see. But because it's a prophecy fulfillment, it has to be also infallibility. Otherwise, the logic of it all destroyed. So this, uh, this you could read this, pause it, and read the rest if you'd like. Um, this is what an Orthodox scholar, Father Alexander Schmemann, many of us know of him because of his outstanding liturgical works. He was actually a historical professor at St. Sergius in in. Um, uh, in Rome, I, I forget it was in Romania. I, I don't remember, but he, his his initial professorship was uh, in in the area of history. This is what he writes about Hormizdas's uh, formula: "Quote characteristic of this eternal compromise with Rome was the signing of the formula of Hormizdas by the Eastern bishops in 519, ending the thirty year schism between Rome and Constantinople." Listen to this, folks. The whole essence of the papal claims cannot be more clearly expressed than in this document, which was imposed upon the Eastern bishops. That's in his The Historical Road of Eastern Orthodoxy, page 241. Dr. Ed Sichensky there on the right side writes that the formula was one of the strongest affirmations of Rome's teaching authority ever accepted in the East. That is in his papacy in the Orthodox, page 132. Medieval historian Jeffrey Burton Russell, yes, he's a Catholic, but his reputation proceeds. He sees the climax of papal development in Pope Hormistas. He says, quote, Pope Hormizdas first intimated the final degree of papal claims. In other words, if we're talking about development of doctrine, he sees the final development, the apex of papal development, of infallibility, when he said, that's Hormizdas, when he said the Catholic religion has always been immaculate, preserved in the apostolic see. That's in his Medieval Civilization, uh, page 69. Dear Maid Micullo, this is a, a historian, he's a Protestant, I think he's a Methodist, uh, he comments, quote, the pronouncement of papal infallibility at the First Vatican Council of 1870 is inconceivable without this foundation. And if you go to that text, he's talking about the formula of Hermistas. That, that very formula is uh, a foundation, which means, in theory, that the formula of Hormizdas has an organic implication that could serve as a conceivable foundation for the 1870 dogma of papal infallibility. Henry Chadwick, he's there at the top right, 
states that the Hormiz Hormizdas's intervention in the East made it a condition that Greek bishops submit to papal authority with signatures to a formula destined to have a long future, destined to have a long future at Florence and Vatican I, that he made a successful insistence that the Greek churches acknowledge the Petrine authority of the papal office with the corollary, corollary, that communion with Rome entails the obedience to papal directive and jurisdiction. That's in his East and West, page 53 and 190. The logical concept, and here's a, this is just a, uh, a small uh, conclusion in my presentation. The logical concept of papal infallibility far precedes the 13th century, contrary to tyranny, and is firmly rooted in the patristic, papal, and conciliar patrimony as far back as the 6th century. It reaches centuries before even the 6th, but time only permits some cursory glances, which will be shown later in this presentation. Tierney, we're going to continue with Tierney. Tierney is so skeptical about papal infallibility that he even thinks our friend, Dollinger was radically wrong in reading the documents of history. Dollinger had a far more reasonable interpretation of the documentary evidence. He saw papal infallibility as originating in the pseudo Isidorian decretals of the ninth century. So Dollinger ended up saying it was a complete invention, but he at least plotted the origin to the 9th century decretals. Tierney's trying to plot it in the 13th century. Anyhow, Tierney, who held that infallibility was invented in the 13th century, obviously thinks that Dollinger was reading infallibility into earlier texts. Can you imagine that? Dollinger reading infallibility into earlier texts. However, Tierney's criticism of Dollinger is precisely correct. We'll see why. He writes, quote, Dollinger's argument is no more convincing than Manning's, He's referring to Cardinal Manning. The fundamental objection to his account is that it is based on a radical misunderstanding of the canonical tradition of the medieval church. Dollinger was anxious to prove that the doctrine of papal infallibility originated in the ninth century forgeries, but this led him to apply a kind of double standard in his interpretation of canonical texts. When dealing with genuine patristic writings, Dollinger always used the argument from silence in a negative sense. Since the doctrine of papal infallibility was not explicitly affirmed, it was taken to be implicitly denied. But when he dealt with the forged texts, Dollinger was quite willing to see papal infallibility implied, even though it was not explicitly asserted. And in this interpretation, he was very probably wrong, close quote, says Tierney. Tierney is right here. I'll give credit to Dollinger to, to giving more sense to the earlier texts. But what Tierney is saying here, for those of you who didn't, who didn't understand exactly what he's saying here, T uh, Dollinger would read things like Hormizdas, and we'll see later. This is this is the 1859 upward Dollinger. Before 1859, Dollinger had a, a very different reading of the, of the sources. But after his turn from the papacy, he would see Hormizdas and Leo the Great and Nicholas the uh, First, and he would say, you know, these guys are not teaching infallibility. But when he went to the decretals. He's like, see, see, there they are. But the problem is the same claims in the decretals on the papacy are the same claims in the, in the uh, undisputed texts. So Tierney is actually finding a, a real inconsistency in Dollinger. But again, Dollinger's, he's way out of whack too because of, of, of his plotting of the of infallibility in the 13th century. Now, I told you about the 1859 Dollinger. Well, I'm going to tell you about the Dollinger before that. Um, Dollinger was an 
excellent historian. Cardinal Newman even said this man is stands alone in the the prestige that he has as a historian. In his volumes on the history of the church, published in 1840, Dollinger was clearly on board with the essence of the papacy. The following comes from volume two, translated from German by Edward Cox. Quote, that the decrees of synods regarding faith obtained their full power and authority only by being received and confirmed by the Pope was publicly acknowledged in the fourth century. Close quote. I bring this up because Gavin had made mention that this thing about, you know, the, the Pope needing to have uh, uh, ratification. No, he was asked for it was asked for his ratification but not as different than needing his ratification. Well, here's Dollinger at the height of his career saying that it's already publicly acknowledged in the fourth century. That's in the 300s. By the fifth century, it was clear, according to Dollinger, I'm quoting, so if you read the screen, that, quote, a judgment of the apostolic see was inviolable and that he who should presume to act against it cuts himself off from the church. Dollinger goes on, the See of Rome was, by virtue of the promises of Christ, the immovable foundation of faith, close quote. He goes on, quote, as the visible representative of ecclesial unity, the Bishop of Rome was the center with which every other bishop was necessarily either immediately or immediately, united. He who was not in communion with him, Dolinger says, was not recognized by him, was not truly in the Catholic Church. I need to say some more here from Dolinger. Quote, when during the pontificate of Hormizdas, here we go, we're going back to the sources I had mentioned, the schism which had begun by the patriarch Acacius was at length terminated after a duration of 35 years. About 2,500 Oriental bishops signed a formulary which had been sent to them by the Pope, on which occasion they confessed that he who was not in all things united with the apostolic see was cut off from the Catholic Church, close quote. Moreover, quote, the fifth general council, so we're, we're coming close to pr close proximity to to the 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 the, the whole topic in, in, in this for this session. The fifth general council, which Justinian convoked against the will of Agilius, was in the beginning not an ecumenical synod. <laughs> and it acquired the character only by receiving the confirmation of the Pope. Pelagius II, one of the near successors of Legilius, therefore asserted that the convocation of general councils was a prerogative attached to the See of Rome. The deacon Ferrandus, we're going to get to him later. The deacon Ferrandus asserted that it was by this confirmation by the Pope that the council first acquired its authority. And in general, he declared that ecumenical councils, which had received confirmation of the Pope, were in authority highest next to the sacred scriptures. On the other hand, it was acknowledged to be the prerogative of the first see in the Christian world that the Bishop of Rome could be judged by no one. Close quote. This is Dollinger's A History of the Church, Volume 2, pages 223 and 24 and 228. I recommend anybody go read his volumes on the history of the church. They're outstanding. They were published in 1840. I find them immensely useful. But Gavin quoted Dollinger, where he, he Dollinger said that he was just he was losing his mind over how over 18 it was about 1830 years. There was nothing like papal infallibility where there's this guy at the top, you know, telling people and there's everybody's under this hierarchical bind to obedience. But look at what he's saying. And I haven't even scratched the surface. If you go read like pages 201 down to 270 in this book, 
which is free online. You can just Google it. You can read it on Google Books. You will see him saying more outstanding things that I just didn't have space and time to put in here. So uh, another historian that Gavin uh, rightly quoted was Father Klaus Schatz. Schatz, uh, Schatz's book is great in many ways, and it's, it's open to some criticism in other ways. But I want to quote something that Schatz says here. Historically speaking, he says, the Roman primacy of jurisdiction and teaching as dogmatically sanctioned at Vatican I developed historically as a result of a great many factors. And we're all in agreement there. The recognition of the Roman Church as the center of communion existed by the 4th or 5th century in the West and in some less clear fashion in the East as well. This recognition, of course, was historically still open to a more federal or Episcop Episcopalist and conciliar church structure, and there have, been sent there have been tendencies in that direction throughout the centuries. To the extent, one must say, speaking historically, that Vatican I proposed and gave the stamp of approval to one particular line of tradition, one tendency that can be traced back to late antiquity. To identify that tendency specifically with pseudo-Isidore, the Gregorian period, or some later point, is to oversimplify the course of history. The origins of papal primacy of jurisdiction can no more be assigned to a specific fixed point in time than can papal infallibility. Every new appearance is anchored by a hundred rootlets to earlier motifs, ideas, formulas, and law, close quote. That's in his Papal Primacy 176. Now, Shat, I don't agree with everything that uh, Father Shat says here, but what you have here is a reliable historian. Gavin saw him as reliable. He, he quoted him. Um, and he saw, he, he, he's admitting that you can't, you can't say that papal infallibility and supremacy, Vatican I, is like an accretion from years later, because even though there might have been tendencies toward conciliarism, tendencies toward federalism, there was still a tendency towards papal supremacy. And Vatican I just sort of chose that tendency and put a stamp of approval on it. I don't agree with that, that reconstruction of history. But what it shows is a uh, is a a reliable historian who can trace the papal claims of Vatican I back to late antiquity. So at the very least, what that shows is that um, it, 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 we should we should stifle uh, claims that keep trying to put Vatican I and its doctrine like into the second millennium, like medieval period. Okay, so that's that wraps it up for papal infallibility, papal supremacy. Um, we're going back to the Pope. Uh, this is Pope uh, Nicholas um, to the. Uh, this is towards the Council of Constantinople of eight eight sixty nine. This is what Pope Nicholas says. Furthermore, if you do not listen to us, it remains that you be held by us as our Lord Jesus Christ and joins to hold those who refuse to hear the church of God. If, a little bit further down there in the bold, you'll see that the claims the Roman church can by no means be diminished, infringed, or altered since no effort of man has power to remove a foundation which God has laid and what God has established stands firm and unshakable. These privileges then were bestowed on this holy church by Christ. Now, if you want to read the rest, you could read it. Just hit pause. I'm just going to read the last sentence. It is immediately clear that the judgments of the apostolic see, than which there is no greater authority, that's the definition of supreme, cannot be handled by any other tribunal, nor is it permissible for any to sit in judgment upon its decision. Appeals are to be made to that seat from any part of the world, such as the meaning of the canons. My citation is there. That's uh, This is in year 869. I'm working backwards, folks. 
So I'm not starting at eighth century and going upward. I'm going I'm going backwards. All right. So here uh, is the Libri Carolini. This is uh, just means Charles books. Um, this is 790, uh, and I'm ch I'm chose I chose to go backwards because um, Gavin and others we speak about the first millennium. Right. Gavin said that papal supremacy, papal infallibility is not characteristic of the first millennium. Well, I'm going to read a section now in 790, which is, you know, over 200 years before the first millennium is over. And look at what it says here in th this is the the Caroline books. OK, and I know there's some sticky history behind this with the images, with the Frankish realm, with the Council of Nicaea 787 and Pope, uh, uh, the, the popes who were in defense of the of the image veneration. Um, but and, and we could discuss that at length. If anybody would like to, you know, wait a minute, Eric, the Franks went against the popes. Uh, we could do. Uh, we, we could ask that in the comments. I can give you more information on that. But let's just hear what these bishops in France have to say about the Roman Church. Quote, before entering upon a discussion of the witnesses, which the Easterns have absurdly brought forward in their synod. He's referring to the Council of Nicaea 787. We think well to set forth how greatly the Roman Church has been exalted by the Lord above the other churches, and how she is to be consulted by the faithful. And this is especially the case since only such books as she receives as canonical and only such fathers as she recognized by Galatius and other pontiff, his successors, are to be accepted and followed. That's far more than a primacy of prominence. This is literally saying that we only receive the divine canon and the church fathers according to Rome. Okay, that's 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 outstanding. We're going to go on here. Nor are they to be interpreted by the private will of anyone, but wisely and soberly. For just as the apostles were exalted above the other disciples, he's talking about the 70, that the, the apostles were exalted about uh, above the others, and Peter was exalted above the other apostles, so also the apostolic sees are exalted above the other seas, and the Roman is eminent over the other apostolic seas. And this exaltation arises from no synodical action of, of the churches, but she holds this primacy by the authority of the Lord himself when he said, he quotes Matthew 16, all Catholic churches should regularly observe so that they may seek help from her after Christ, literally, right underneath Christ, for protecting the faith. And although many have separated from this holy and venerable communion, nevertheless, never have the churches of our part done so, but instructed by that apostolic erudition and by his assistance from whom cometh every good and perfect gift, have always received the venerable charismata and are careful to follow the see of blessed Peter in all things as they desire thither to arrive where he sits as keeper of the keys to which blessedness may he who deigned to found his church upon Peter bring us and make us to persevere in the unity of the Holy church. And may we merit a place in that kingdom of heaven through the intervention of him who see we follow and to whom have been given the keys. This is in PL, uh, this is uh, quoted in the the Nicene and post Nicene Fathers, Volume Fifteen, Page Five Eighty. You could also just type this out in Google, and you'll find it on New Advent as well. Um, the Anglican who did the translation of the Caroline books, Henry Percival. This is what he says. Quote: This is what he says about what these Frank French bishops wrote in seven ninety. Quote, such is the doctrinal foundation of the Caroline books, the absolute authority of the Roman see in matters pertaining to the faith of the church. Close quote. All right. Pope St. Agatha. So we're talking about papal supremacy, but we're revisiting him. 
When Emperor Constantine IV invited Pope St. Agatho to send representatives to Constantinople in order to bring the Eastern Seas that had broken from the Church via monothelitism back into formal union with the Apostolic See, Pope Agatho, according to Dr. Ed Sichensky, quote, insisted that there could be no doctrinal debate since the matter had already been decided at the Lateran Synod, close quote, that's in his the papacy in the orthodox page 205 indeed at the opening of the council in 681 the papal legates say the following we have received di we have we have directed persons from our humility to your valor protected of god which shall offer to you the report of us all that is of all the bishops in the northern and western regions that met at the roman synod this is the roman synod in which, too, we have summed up the confession of our apostolic faith, yet not as those who wished to contend about these things as being uncertain, but by being certain and unchangeable, to see them forth in a brief definition, suppliantly beseeching you that by the favor of your sacred majesty, you would command these same things to be preached to all and to have force with all, close quote. So in other words, Agatho here is writing from the Roman council. See, he called a council in Rome. And he's he's not saying, hey, we're coming to offer our contribution to the council. He's saying this matter is unchangeable. It's certain, has already been resolved. The only reason why we're going over there to Constantinople is because you are the governor of the realm. And we know that you can broadcast this to everybody. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes, you know, you hear from folks, why did they have councils if the papacy was true? Well, in each one of the councils, you'll notice that Rome never invited negotiation. This is one of those instances. Pope, uh, uh, Pope St. Agatho's look at previous magisterial history. So we're going to go into the mind of Pope Agatho, who's a saint in both the East and the West. He's writing in 680. So this is over 100 years after the situation of Vigilius. Remember, because this we're, 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 we're headed towards Vigilius in Constantinople, too. The whole idea is, man, this Vigilius event, that's a big shaker to the Catholic Church, isn't it? Well, look at what this guy says, who obviously knew the history of the previous councils. He mentions it. This is what he says. Quote, for he, Peter, received from the Redeemer of all himself by three commendations. The duty of feeding the spiritual sheep of the church under whose protecting shield this apostolic church of his has never turned away from the path of truth in any direction of error. Now listen to this. Whose authority as that of the prince of all the apostles, the whole Catholic church and the ecumenical synods have faithfully embraced and followed in all things. And all the Venerable Fathers have embraced its apostolic doctrine through which they, as the most approved luminaries of the Church of Christ, have shown, and the Holy Orthodox doctors have venerated and followed it, while the heretics, so talk about resistance to Rome, Agatho knows about it, while the heretics have pursued it with false criminations and with derogatory hatred. So, Agatho is saying that the previous ecumenical synods followed the authority of Rome. Let me ask you, if you're going to try and find who's superior in that formula, the councils followed the apostolic see, who is le who's landing at a higher status of authority? In Agatho's mind, it's very clear that the councils were subservient to the Rome, right? Because I, I want to speak to this because this is a letter written to the Council of Constantinople and embraced as one of the Council's own statements. And the statement that this is making 
is that it's not a primacy of just general prominence or some prerogative and privilege that comes from Rome being the capital of the Roman Empire. What we see here is radically different. You can see that. Um, Petrine papal jurisdiction in the east. When monothelitism took over the seas of Antioch and Jerusalem, Pope St. Theodore and St. Martin appealed to their divine authority and jurisdiction through the Petrine papal succession in order to legitimate a special intervention, legitimize a special intervention in the affairs of these eastern churches. Martin, Pope Martin, dispatches John of Philadelphia to go to the east in order to, quote, correct things which are wanting and appoint bishops, presbyters, and even deacons in every city of those who are subject to the see, both of Jerusalem and Antioch. We charging you to do this in every way in virtue of the apostolic authority which has been given to us by the Lord in the person of of the most blessed Peter, Prince of the Apostles, on account of the necessities of our time and the pressure of the nations. So this is a an episode in church history, monothelitism, where the popes were sending vicars with binding jurisdiction in Antioch and Jerusalem. I brought this up because, you know, Gavin was inquiring, where do we see in the first millennium it, it, this idea where the, the the other churches have to obey the See of Rome, or that Rome has some sort of intervening jurisdiction in the East. This is what Father Price has to say about this event. Father Price comments on the intervention taken by Pope Martin in the Monothelite East. He says, quote, Martin's instructions to John of Philadelphia to consecrate Catholic bishops in Syria and Palestine constituted an attempt to replace the patriarchates of Antioch and Jerusalem by direct Roman jurisdiction and would have been perceived in the East as utterly uncanonical. But it had been anticipated a few years before by Pope Theodore, who had instructed Stephen of Dora, acting as his representatives, to depose Monothelite Palestinian bishops. That's in the Acts of Latin Synod. A, an Orthodox historian, he's, this is an Orthodox historian I'm going to quote here, Dr. Andrew Economu, a Byzantine historian, says the following on Pope Theodore, quote, Theodore turned his attention toward the situation in his own homeland, Jerusalem, this, this was a pope that was born in Jerusalem, in another unusual assertion of papal authority over matters within the jurisdiction of an eastern patriarchate the pope took the extraordinary measure of naming bishop stephen of dor as apostolic vicar for palestine with plenary authority to depose the uncanonical melanthelite bishops who had been ordained by sergius of joppa source at the end there this is another citation from economu Quote, no longer was the Roman church content to collaborate with God's representative on earth, that's the emperor, by yielding to him, albeit a heretic, the exclusive prerogative of summoning a general council. Remember, Gavin brought this issue up about call and council. Even while reserving to bishops alone the right to determine matters of faith as such at such assemblies. Cough, Constantinople too, cough. By presuming to arrogate to the Pope, that's my addition, by the way, in brackets, by presuming to arrogate to the Pope the exclusive guardianship of orthodoxy, Pope Theodore and Maximus, the confessor, boldly challenged the emperor's authority to supervise and direct divine matters, thereby denying him a prerogative that had belonged to and been exercised by every emperor since Constantine, having effectively denied the emperor his traditional role in matters pertaining to the faith, Rome could now act alone to impose its exclusive authority over the entire church. Simply stated, the Roman church had become the equivalent to the universal church. Close quote. Now, I might not ever agree with it. it's kind of 
it's kind of high praise for Rome here. But it, it didn't pan out as as crisp as as it's being said here. But what I'm trying to say here is that even an Orthodox historian recognizes that the claims and the actions of Rome were those of somebody who was conscious of universal jurisdiction. We're gonna go. We're gonna go to the formula for mist. That's we're working our way back to the sixth century now, five nineteen. Doctor Alexander Evers, professor of classical studies and ancient history, and I chose him because he's actually one of the specialists who's looking into translating the Collectio Avalana, which is the is the collection of Latin texts where we get so much from the occasion schism and hormistas. This is what Evers says that about the formula of Hormistus that ended the occasion schism. Quote, the Pope did not show any intention of compromise. All parties, factions, congregations, and communities of the faithful, their leaders, as well as individual souls, were subject were to subject themselves to the faith and the authority of the See of Rome. With his libellus, Hormizdas made everyone bow to the authority of the See of Rome, particularly the East, founded on the very words of Jesus Christ. Source there at the bottom. But the book there is on the right side. It's kind of expensive. This is uh, Volker Menz. Uh, he's a medievalist historian specializes in the uh, history of the Middle Ages, especially with the Eastern schisms. According to Volker Menz, a professor of history and medieval studies, quote, by implementing the libellus together with an imperial edict, the faith of Rome was unquestionably accepted, and thereby the primacy of Rome established also in the East. It was more than a general council could ever possibly have done for the papacy, close quote. All right, we're going to work backwards from uh, Hormizdas to Leo, writing in 450. You could read the whole text uh, on your own. I'm just going to go to the meat. The connection of the whole body makes all alike healthy. He's talking about the unity of the body. And though all the apostles have a common dignity, they do not have a uniform rank, inasmuch as even among the blessed apostles, Notwithstanding the similarity of their honorable estate, there was a certain distinction of power. And while the election of them was all equal, yet it was given to one to take the lead of the rest. Everyone should not claim everything for himself, but that there should be in each province, so he's talking about the provinces of the Roman Empire, one whose opinion should have the priority among the brethren. And again, that certain whose appointment is in the greater cities should undertake a fuller responsibility through whom the care of the universal church should converge toward Peter's one seat and nothing anywhere should be separated from its head. Now, I want uh, to mention, I have an article on my blog. It's called 18 Non-Catholic Historians on Pope Leo the Great. And I give you some of the stellar stars in pro a Protestant and Orthodox scholarship that talk about Leo the Great and how the Vatican I Council is not much more of a development than what you already have in Leo. In fact, we're going to see what some of those scholars say. An associate or a close contemporary to Leo, is St. Peter Chrysologus. This is a major saint in, in Eastern Orthodoxy as well. He's very, uh, he was a great preacher. Um, but Eutychius, that's the Archimandrite who, who stirred up the big controversy that eventually led to uh, Ephesus 449 and, and eventually Chalcedon. Eutychius wrote to St. Peter basically saying, what should I do? St. Peter was in Ravenna. Because uh, Eutyches wrote to everybody. He wrote to the Pope. He wrote to St. Peter in Ravenna. He wrote to the other Eastern patriarchs. This is what St. Peter said. We exhort you that you obediently listen to what has been written by the blessed Pope of the city of Rome. Since blessed Peter, who lives and presides in his own see, offers the truth of the faith to those who seek. For we, 
This is the this is the Archbishop of Ravenna. Okay, for we in our zeal for peace and faith cannot decide questions of faith apart from the consent of the Bishop of Rome. Close quote. And he, what is he basing that off? An imperialization of the faith and the Roman Empire and Rome being the primate because it's the seat. Of, no, he says Peter, who lives and presides in his own seat, which is talking about the person of his successor. Pope Leo's tome, I have argued for many years, and I consistently still hold, that Pope St. Leo the Great's tome is an, ind is an indication early on of a dogma from Rome. This is what Richard Price has to say about Leo's tome. Quote, in all, Pope Leo regarded the doctrinal controversy as having been settled by his tome. If there had to be a council, he held that apart from settling the status of persons, it should simply acknowledge and confirm the teaching of the tome as the definitive ruling on the points at issue. The last thing he wanted was a reopening of the debate as if the teaching of the heir and successor of St. Peter were simply one among a plethora of of competing voices, close quote. Henry Chadwick says the following on the tone, quote, in Leo's judgment, however, the function of the Greek council was to manifest its own orthodoxy by submissively indicating its assent to the ruling already given by himself, the legitimate juridical successor of Peter, the prince of the apostles. It was axiomatic for Leo that the Roman see has received and guards the true apostolic tradition is predestined by God for this service to the entire church is therefore protected from leading the church astray. Hello, infallibility and in jurisdiction possesses a universal responsibility inherent in being Peter's successor. That's in East West 48, 49. Um, I bring that up because, you know, Price and Chadwick, those are premier scholars. And and they're saying, look, this Leo's consciousness is already what basically we're seeing in Vatican I. But there's another scholar, not not as widely known. This is uh, Father Wilhelm, or the late Father Wilhelm Devries, as uh, he's a uh, scholar of the Byzantine and the uh, the Latin history in the Middle Ages. Uh, but specifically about the Roman papacy. This is what he has to say. I don't agree with everything, so let me forewarn you. But look at what he says. Quote, in the Roman view, its own decision was the definitive one. The council was not able to debate, but it simply had to ratify it. For the East, the council took into account the Roman decision, but debated the issues on its own and came to its own judgment. The decision of the council was the definitive one. Rome and the more collegial East each went on council after council with its own essentially different view, close quote. Now, I, I don't ag actually agree with this, but I wanted to bring this up as a point for Gavin to consider and for those who are following that it's, it's not really as accurate to say that the first millennium was characteristic with conciliarism. And then the papalism of Vatican I showed up like in the 13th century. Rather, what scholars tend to see more and more is that actually Rome started to hold its view on universal jurisdiction and it's the definitiveness of its doctrinal authority early on. But the West had that view, whereas the East had a different view, conciliarism. Now, I, I don't agree with this. I think the East, if it did reject the papacy, it usually did so um, with the emperor's authority practically in the in, in the four. Um, but and, and there's several Eastern saints who accepted the papal claims, as we'll see, Orthodox scholars are going to admit uh, as we get further along in here. Um, but this this is a more responsible view, even though I still disagree with it. 
I think it would be irresponsible to say that Vatican I shows up like in the 12th century, 13th century, or even the 11th century. What historians are seeing is that it's at least in claim and in activity early on, even if it's wrong. Um, here's a case of, you know, because Gavin... Gavin brought the the Vigilius and Constantinopolitan Council as a standoff. You had the council and the pope, and who won in the end? The council won. Well, we also had a slight standoff in 451 with Canon 28, which said that you know the, that Constantinople should be elevated above Alexandria and Antioch. When Pope Leo received the notice that the Greek bishops tried to pass a canon which elevated Constantinople over Alexandria and Antioch, he responded by saying, quote, we do not recognize, and by blessed Apostle Peter's authority, we absolutely disannul in comprehensive terms, close quote. That's letter 105. The patriarch of Constantinople at the time, upon hearing of Pope Leo's annulment of the council's canon, wrote, wrote back to him saying, quote, even so, the whole force and confirmation of the acts was reserved for the authority of your blessedness, close quote. That's Epistle 139 in the Leonine Epistolary. So the Patriarch of Constantinople, who had already for months tried to get that canon passed, is here saying, well, the popes annulled it, so it, the whole force of the canon stands in his decision. So it's dropped, right? Um, Father Francis Dvornik writes, because of his opposition, because of Pope Leo's opposition, Canon 28 was not introduced into the official canonical collections. It only appeared in the 6th century in the Syntagma of 14 titles. Pope Galatius later on writes about this whole issue with Leo's annulment of Canon 28. And he he look at listen listen to what Galatius says about the relationship of Rome and councils, because this gets right to the issue you know the issue with that we're talking about with Gavin's presentation. Uh, quote: These people should know that the on, that only that part must be accepted by the whole church, which is in accordance with holy scriptures, the tradition of our ancestors, in accordance with the canons and regulations of the church. Only that part which promotes the Catholic and apostolic faith, communion, and truth, for the accomplishment of which the apostolic see has ordered this done and has confirmed it after it has been accomplished. But other things, those things which were done or simply talked about through foolish presumption, things which the apostolic see in no way ordered, listen to the language here which were clearly and speedily rejected by the legates of the apostolic see. He's talking about Pope Leo's legates at Chalcedon, which the apostolic see, even with the emperor Marcion asking for them, in other words, the emperor asked the pope to ratify that canon, in no way approved, which the bishop of Constantinople at the time, that's Anatolius, claimed not to have sought and did not deny was in the power of, of the bishop of the apostolic see has not accepted because it was shown to be contradictory to the privileges of the universal church citation at the bottom there um this is galatius saying that it was in the power of pope leo to accept or annul the canons which shows that you know his position to the council is one of superior this is an orthodox uh, liturgical historian, but he was originally a historian of the Middle Ages, church history. Father Alexander Schmemann, he says this, quote, the protest of Pope Leo the Great against the 28th canon of Chalcedon was answered by Patriarch Anatolius with a cowardly renunciation of responsibility for the canon, assuring that the Pope, assuring the Pope that without the latter's approval, not one of the decrees of the ecumenical council could be in effect. <clears throat> this is uh, John Philoponus, 
um, it, he he came up in uh, Gavin's presentation because um, on the issue of uh, Constantinople 553 and Vigilius, uh, John Philoponus or John the Grammarian, uh, as he's better known, he wrote a statement that Father Price brings up in the book about how what ecclesiastical canon ever gave the right to the Pope to ever stand in judgment over a council or decide something on his own, right? Well, that same John, okay, he was actually condemned at the next ecumenical council, uh, 681, for um, for believing that the Trinity has three parts, uh, the essence of the Trinity. Uh, whether he believed that or not, we don't know. But he was condemned in 681. That has nothing to do with the issue here. But he also criticized Pope Leo the Great, the legates of Pope Leo the Great, and the Council of Chalcedon of papal supremacy, which he thinks is just wrong. Of course, he was a uh, he was he was it was a Syriac man. He he was one of the early Aristotelians. He wrote a lot, a lot about Aristotle, and um, he he severely criticized the Council of Chalcedon. He thought it was heretical, and so he wrote a lot against it. But uh, the point I want to make here is um, notice what he says here. I want in, in the in the black uh, highlighted quote. I wonder what canon has given the bishop of Rome all this authority, and what ecclesiastical legislation has empowered him to act. How he willed and issued resolutions without a just council. He's referring to Pope Leo the Great's annulment of Ephesus four four nine. Look at the second highlighted quote. If they the bishops of Rome, were given the apostolic authority of Peter and the keys of heaven were handed to them as they claim. Let them consider the other cities that take pride in the apostles. Look what he says in the third one. For this reason, the bishop of Rome usurped entire power. He's talking about Pope Leo. Usurped entire power while knowing that no ecclesiastical canon or royal ordinance had conferred upon him such power it was nothing but Roman arrogance. So uh, uh, Gavin had you know, brought in John the Grammarian about Vigilius in order to highlight an Eastern voice who was talking about the absolute novelty of what Vigilius was doing. And yet the same John the Grammarian is imputing the same guilt to Leo the Great, whose fame and acceptance and beauty and sanctity was unquestioned by the very heritage that Protestantism embraces. Here's John the Grammarian again, talking about the legate of Leo. And re remember, um, Gavin was talking about how uh, this idea that you have to have the Pope in order to have an ecumenical council is characteristic of Vatican I, which is characteristic of later accretion. But look at what John the Grammarian, who was born in 490, died in 570. Look at what he says. Lucentius, representative of Leo, said he, the Dioscorus, he presumed to hold a council without the permission of the apostolic see, which has never been allowed and has never been done. Look at what John the Grammarian says. Like Paschasinus, Lucentius is asserting here the universal supremacy of Rome over the entire Christian church. Ladies and gentlemen, he's talking about the sanctified legates at the Council of Chalcedon, representing Leo and accepted by the council. Look at that last highlighted statement. I wonder who gave Leo alone the authority to settle church problems. This is the same John the Grammarian that criticized Vigilius. But we'll move on. I just wanted to point out about John the Grammarian. This is, an, uh, this is one of my favorite uh, authors on the papacy, uh, Dr. Beresford J. Kitt. He's a doctor of divinity at Oxford. Um, he was a, a prestigious historian in his day. He wrote volumes of, on history. Um, but the, the, the point I want to bring out here is at the bottom. You could read the top on your own, but the bottom, look at what he says. The Petrine theory, as finally, finally put into shape by Leo, was no doubt held in good faith 
And so it wasn't it wasn't something that Leo invented out of arrogance. And as the only guarantee of unity, the theory has undergone little modification since Leo's day. All other elements of the Leonine theory have remained and are to be found set forth by the Vatican Council. Now, I want you guys to know the modification that he's talking about there is, is a reduction, not an enhancement. So he thinks Leo's understanding of papal uh, supremacy was higher than Vatican I. So this is a, a Protestant whose his reputation precedes him. I still recommend his book on the Roman primacy, which he wrote as a way to refute it, by the way. So he was hostile to the papacy. I have uh, Dr. Michael uh, Haken. Um, he is a, a Protestant historian, um, but he's with us today. Look at what he says here. I'm going to start in the middle, but you could read the, the beginning as, uh, uh, on your own. He just summarizes what Leo taught about papal supremacy. With, far, with such far-reaching claims for papal authority, it is no surprise that Leo's words to his fellow bishops are so frequently terms of governance and obedience to the statutes issued by the apostolic seat. In essence, this is what we've been saying. This is what, what we're saying when we're trying to talk about the papacy. In essence... Leo has established that communion with Rome is a necessary condition for communion with Christ and God. This is in his uh, uh, article, The Development and Consolidation of the Papacy. And this is, this is a well-known uh, Protestant historian uh, who's with us today. Let's go back before St. Leo the Great, because you know some people say, well, Leo the Great invented the papacy. Well, let's see what St. Boniface, who... Um, was an old man, I think, when Leo may have been just a baby. Well, Leo was 22. He was a deacon. But um, Leo was born in 400. But Pope, Pope St. Boniface says the following, quote, the structure of the universal church took its origin from the honor given to Peter. Go down to that highlighted section. It is certain that this church is related to the churches spread over the world as the head to its members. Okay, well, let's stop there. I can accept that as a Protestant. I'm a Lutheran. I'm all right with the Pope being the head of the church. Or, oh, wait a minute. No, I'm Eastern Orthodox. Yeah, I'm okay with the Pope being the head. Yeah, what, what kind of head? I'm okay with that. All right, well, let's keep reading. Whoever cuts himself off from this church places himself outside the Christian religion since he no longer remains part of its structure. It's institutio, which he said began with who? Peter. I hear that certain bishops want to set aside the apostolic constitution, not ecclesial constitution, or an imperial constitution, an apostolic constitution of the church, and are attempting to introduce innovations against Christ's own commands. Look at what he says here. They seek to separate themselves from communion with the apostolic see, or more precisely, from its authority. And look at that word, potestate separare, Epistle 14. Look at what Henry Chadwick has to say about this. Boniface affirms that Peter's church is supreme over all, and that no one can be a Christian who is not in communion with Rome. Now, of course, we have certain statements on how to reconcile that with what we teach since baptism of desire and the you know the the whole issue on the possibility of being saved outside the visible bounds of the church but nevertheless we're not really focused on that we're just focused on what is being said here by the early popes um this is chadwick right and boniface wasn't rejected he's a he's a saint for both the east and the west uh, Dr. Cyril Richardson, he was an Episcopal uh, scholar. He says this, the qu quote, the final definition of papal infallibility in 1870 was but a logical consequence of a doctrine which had been at the root of the papal power from these early days. He's talking about Boniface's time, Leo's time. All right, we're moving on here. 
you know, one thing that Gavin brought up, and I appreciate, he said that, you know, Rome enjoyed a, a general prominence, a primacy. It was a flagship bastion of orthodoxy for several centuries. Um, and I'm glad he said that. I appreciate that. It, you know, it's a, it's a very good thing to be honest about that because this that is historical fact. But what I find interesting is you tend to hear people say that, oh, yeah, Rome. The first the first 1000 years. Oh, yeah. Rome was on fire. But when it comes to understanding the nature, extent and character of her primacy. Oh, no. Do not hand the mic to her. Do not give the mic to Rome, the one who's prestigious to explain where this all came from. No, we got to go to other people to find out where rome's primacy came from and guess what we guess what we find it's the capital of the empire rome uh, peter and paul's uh, bones are there the relics of peter and paul were there people flocked there to venerate the saints um there's this you know sense of being a flagship bastion yeah that's all great and i'm happy to hear all those things but if it's such a flagship bastion of orthodoxy can rome speak for herself when it comes to the origin of her administrative government. I mean, can you imagine for the first 1,000 years, the premier primate of the universal church had been consistently misunderstanding her own position? It just doesn't make any sense. All right, now we're at the end here, Vigilius and Justinian. I say Vigilius versus Justinian because that's really what it was. Um, well, the first thing I'd like to say here is that Justinian before the council had put a certain status for the Roman church into the code of his law. And you can read this on your own here, but I'm just going to summarize. Justinian already held to papal supremacy, at least in confession, in his own imperial code. And he even put um, a statement from Pope John II in that code, which talks about submitting all doctrinal questions to the, uh, to the apostolic see of Rome in light of its vocation from Christ and St. Peter. That was in the Justinian's code. So whatever is going to happen, and we are going to talk about Vigilius and, and, and Justinian, this background has to be known. OK, it's, it's, it's not as if, um, you know, Rome was just recognized as a general primate with honor. The language that the code uses and, you know, go back and, and rewind and read the first one, read the second one. All this language is talking about obedience, submission, doctrinal authority based on divine institution. OK, so the three chapters controversy, what were the three chapters? All right, so the three chapters were three bodies of documents by Theodore of Mopsuestia, Theodoret of Cyrus, and Ebas of Edessa. And what was the point of this whole controversy with the three chapters? Well, Justinian, like Gavin said, quite rightly, he summarized the history beautifully, in fact. Um, Justinian wanted to unite the Miaphysites with the bigger body of Christians in the Roman Empire. And he knew that the Miaphysites had a certain beef with these three cats, Theodore of Mopsuestia, Theodoret of Cyrus, and Ebus. So Justinian, being the strategist he was, said, well, let's collect their writings and make like an open showing of our rejection. Because they keep saying that our acceptance of Chalcedon means the acceptance of Theodore and Theodoret's pre-Chalcedonian writings and a certain letter by Evas. So Justinian says, let's just make an open uh, a, a condemnation of this. Now, not everybody was on the same board, uh, was on the same page. A lot of people in the West thought that those writings were actually Chalcedonian writings that they were orthodox. You see this like in North Africa, you see this in other places in the in the in the west. 
But Justinian happened to be a little bit above, uh, ahead of the game doctrinally. Um, he knew. Um, he was a theologian, for those you, you don't know. He was he knew his Christology. Um, and so he said, well, we clearly can do this. But for everybody else, the third, third bullet there, this was a threat to the Council of Chalcedon. It was, nothing but red flags went up when this whole issue of the three chapters came up. How did the Eastern patriarchs respond when they heard that Justinian wanted them to, uh, you know, to sign on to the condemnation of the three chapters? They said, no way, Jose. I've got to wait to see what uh, the Bishop of Rome says. And this is quite replete in the historical historiography here. Just pick up, you know, read Price's book. That's a great place to start. But at first, they were showing subservience to Rome, saying, no, we have to wait till what Rome says. But then Justinian applied aggressive force. He deposed the Patriarch of Alexandria, replaced him with somebody who was cooperative. He deposed the Archbishop of Carthage, replaced him with somebody who was cooperative. So everybody kind of saw what happened. You know, you got a couple of smashings the hands coming over on your head, what do you do? All right, well, I'm going to sign on. Um, but they were saying, we're signing on with the condition that whatever the Bishop Rome says, I could, I might have to go back on what I'm saying. So the very inception of the controversy shows this intent on being obedient to Rome. And look at that statement there from Price at the, at the fourth bullet. The emperor's response was to summon Vigilius to, to Constantinople, where a combination of persuasion and threats might win his support and through him. Th this is why he didn't kidnap any of the other Eastern patriarchs. He, I say kidnap, Vigilius, Vigilius was old. Um, he forced Vigilius to come to Constantinople because he knew the impact that the Pope would have. Um, through him, the submission of the other bishops of both East and West who still withheld their signatures. So this is, what I'm trying to say here is, this was an imperial project from the get-go. Uh, Gavin had said, um, you know, especially at this time, the idea that the Bishop of Rome's uh, involvement or participation at councils was, at, it was sought, it was requested, it was, you know, begged perhaps, but not necessary. It just so happens that a, a prominent theologian at the time, and if you don't know this guy, you should get to know him, Fulgentius Ferrandus. He was a well-known theologian and canonist in Carthage. And uh, he was consulted on this whole issue of the three chapters controversy. And in his mind, he thought, oh my goodness, this is a threat to Chalcedon. This is what he says about it. General councils particularly those that have gained the assent of the Roman church, hold a place of authority second only to the canonical books. I had cited this from a different translation earlier, if you don't remember. What has been concluded by the judgment of holy bishops and most carefully tested and confirmed by, by being taken to the memoria of the blessed Peter must be followed and must be embraced. They ought not to be subjected to revision through any pretext of piety. Where would he have found greater judges in the church when he had in front of him, in its legates, the apostolic see itself? In other words, there are there is no greater judge when you have the apostolic see there. Whose assent, meaning the assent of the apostolic see, whose assent gave to whatever synod, to, to whatever the synod defined, invincible strength, close quote. So at the time, a premier theologian and canonist who was sought from afar, people were always writing him for advice. This is what he says about the relationship between Rome and councils, namely that when Rome ratifies a council, it's irrevisable. It's up there just under sacred scripture, and it has invincible strength. That's different than a general prominence. I am sorry. 
that's different than just a general primacy. All right. Pope Vigilius condemned the, the three chapters on papal. Uh, Pope Vigilius condemned the three chapters and should say and papal authority. All right. When um, when Pope Vigilius finally came around to to ratifying the council, it's normally pictured that Vigilius sort of like capitulated to the council, admitted everything that they did was right, accepted his excommunication, came out repenting and saying, I submit to the council, I humbled myself. That's actually not what happened. Listen to what Price says here, quote, when he capitulated to imperial pressure and came to sign the second letter to Eutychios and the second constitutum, this is at the end when Vigilius comes around, he in no way lessened his claim to supremacy. He confirmed the decrees of the council, but he did not confirm its authority. Indeed, he made no mention of it at all. Instead, he took over its decrees and issued them in his own name. This is very important. Vigilius didn't sort – it's not – I mean he's the pope who is on the other end of what the council is doing, and yet he didn't, he didn't succumb to it. I mean if the council was trying to muscle up over Vigilius, the right response would be for Vigilius to surrender. And yet that's not what he does. Okay. The other thing that needs to be recognized is that Vigilius never confessed that he hereticized. He never comes out and agrees with the council that he was a heretic or an, an historian. Um, he, and, and by the way, that wasn't the council's initiative. Gavin was 100% right when he said that this was Justinian's plan. Justinian gave the orders and the bishops obeyed, okay? When Vigilius finally decided to condemn the three chapters, he never confesses that he erred in the faith. In his famous epistle to Patriarch Eutychios, which was supposedly to initially, was supposed to initially prove to the emperor the pope's ratification of the council, the pope explains the division between himself and the emperor over the last nine years in the following words, quote, no one is ignorant of the scandals that the enemy of the human race has stirred up throughout the world. And he tried to separate us who are residing with our brethren and fellow bishops in the imperial city and who, and he's describing himself here, he's describing himself for all those years that he was held in captivity, who uphold the four councils with equal reverence and blamelessly persevere in the one and the same faith of these four councils with the result that we who were and are in agreement over the one faith spurned brotherly love and were seduced into discord close quote so vigilius doesn't come out saying yes i'm the historian like the seventh session said i'm sorry no he says he's been held in the same faith the entire time but the devil did pull some tricks to bring division. Now, the controversy over the three chapters is not a robust doctrinal debate. I know that sounds strange, but it's related to doctrine. Don't get me wrong. It's related to the issue of the uh, with the Miaphysites. It's related to Chalcedon. Everybody at the time thought it was an issue of faith. So uh, let me explain. The particular issue that Pope Vigilius had was not a doctrinal issue. The reason why Vigilius hesitated on the three chapters was this issue of issuing post posthumous condemnations of people who had died in the peace of the church for decades. And Vigilius thought, okay, maybe we can say that what they wrote at a certain time was wrong, but they died in the church. So they may have repented before they died. We don't know. Let God be the judge. That, and, and Vigilius was pointed to Galatius, to Leo. There was a bunch of wisdom saying that you don't condemn people after they died in the peace of the church. But other voices like Augustine and others did support this idea. And so the Justinian took advantage. No, Augustine, Augustine said you could do it. And there's some other evidences that we could. So he was pushing this issue. 
that no, you, you can't just say that Theodore was wrong in what he wrote. You've got to anathematize him. So now that that's not a doctrinal disagreement right there. You see that? I mean, perhaps you can come up with a doctrine on the ecclesial licity of condemning somebody after they're dead, but that's not a controversy today anymore. So the significance of that kind of evaporates. Theodore of Cyrus, Vigilius also didn't agree with his pre-Chalcedonian writings. He just said, look, Theodoret was reconciled at Chalcedon. Leave him alone. We shouldn't even be shouldn't even be issuing any uh, sentences on him. Now, the letter of Ebos is a little bit of a different story. Here, you do have a letter that was being claimed to be heretical. And the Pope initially condemned it, but then he said, ah, I think we could read this in an orthodox way. So in other words, he took Ebos's letter and put the Council of Chalcedon right next to it, and he saw that you could bridge them to be the same message because he thought that Ebos's, the contents of Ebos's letter was Cyrillian. In ortho and its Christology, so he made a mismatch. You know, it's kind of like what happened with Pelagius, Celestius, and Pope Zosimus, if you recall. Pelagius went to Rome and explained his view, and it sounded like what he was saying was what Augustine was saying. So Pope Zosimus was like, "No, we've got a this guy is fine. He's not a heretic." Well, everybody was like, "What? Are you crazy?" Well, once Zosimus realized he was being bamboozled he was like okay yeah so but the nature of that is not an error in faith or doctrine it's an error in fact it's different than being erroneous in a doctrinal decree from the beginning all the way through pope vigilius held to the four ecumenical councils chalcedon leo's tome cyril's letters and um his reputations of Nestorians. So formally, uh, uh, he was, uh, Vigilius was orthodox. The whole issue came down to, can we really condemn the dead and Ebos's letter can be read in an orthodox way? So that's really what the council looked. And they, they accused him of Nestorianism for that. All right. That's a little over the top. And it's no wonder that when Vigilius came around and said, no, no, I'm going to condemn the three chapters, we're done. It, we're just going to get it over with. Uh, Vigilius had the entire section where the Pope was you know, excommunicated or his name was removed from the diptychs. He had the entire section expunged from the Acts. So the, the full edition that that was at the end there, did not contain any excommunication, excommunication of uh, Vigilius. Vigilius never recanted anything. I mean, he said, okay, we have we made a mismatch here. Ebos's letter is wrong. I, was, I thought it was Chalcedonian. It's not. Um, but that kind of error that he fixed there was an error of oversight on fact because he came in thinking he was saying precisely what Cyril was saying. Now, um, that goes to the Constitution, of the Second Constitution or Constitutum. Was that a doctrinal backflip in the form of ex cathedra? And I argue that it's not, for the reasons I've already said. But more particularly, in Constitutum 2, all he, in Constitutum 1, all he's saying is that the letter of Ebos has been protected by Chalcedon, which is infallible. Everybody agrees that it was infallible. So he and he he excommunicated anybody who condemned the letter of Ebos because he understood that that letter was protected by Chalcedon. So his decree was anybody who decides to question the letter of Ebos as if the council of Chalcedon could err, let them be anathema. So it's not exactly a fresh definition of doctrine. 
That's what Vatican I says about papal infallibility. Now, we could get into this issue of dogmatic fact, secondary objects of infallibility, not my area, but I don't think that we can apply that in this case because the while there is a fact in mind, Vigilius had an excommunication against those who were questioning Chalcedon. That's what he saw as at threat. So it was an error in fact. So it somebody could even argue that it was a disciplinary decision. That's possible, you know. There, uh, and and I, I I speak in possibilities here because this is an area that hasn't largely been talked about by our own magisterium in the Catholic Church, and I wish there would be. And the scholarship seems to want to stay away from it as well. Um, so anybody who's listening to this, who's going going into PhD studies. Uh, this whole Vigilius thing and the constitutions, it's ripe. Um, so that's what I have to say about that. And and Gavin even conceded that this doesn't necessarily have to be an issue of uh, papal infallibility because uh, Vigilius was under duress. So there there have been theologians have, who have pointed to that fact and have said, you know, this is this is you know the Pope's being forced, like all the other bishops are being forced. Um, so this is not exactly the test case you would want to use to falsify papal infallibility. What you want to do is go to a pope who's living in peace and who's, who out of his own volition makes a decree on the entire church, on doctrine, and then absolutely fails. That would be where you want to go. Not this. This is a really, I mean, Vigilius is a punching bag here, you know? Um so, but props to Gavin for recognizing that. But then he said, but it is an issue with papal supremacy. Um, but again, papal supremacy, uh, is I don't think it's being challenged because, like I said, Vigilius doesn't submit to the council. I mean, just think about what Theodoret did at Chalcedon. They were calling him to recant before they would restore him. So if the bishops at Cal Constantinople II were really intent on holding to their excommunication, which they weren't. They were forced by Justinian. Um, they would have demanded that that Vigilius admit that he was a, an historian. But we don't have that. Vigilius never submits to it. So it's really a dead letter. And 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 uh, Vigilius had it expunged from the council. Um, so I don't think it's a workable objection anymore in light of that. Now, for sources on that, uh, Price there in Volume 1, page 104, you can go to the book there that's pictured on the right. This is a, an Orthodox scholar, Father Asterios Gorostergios. That's a hard one to pronounce. Justinian the Great, the Emperor and Saint. Um, those pages there, uh, page 144, he talks about how the, the, the entire section where they removed the Pope's name from the diptychs was was taken out. There's another Orthodox scholar, Evangelos Chrysos, one of the go-to sources on this council um, in his book there, pages 145 to 199, uh, to, he, he also shows definitively that um, Vigilius went home with a council that did not, the acts of a council that did not mention any kind of excommunication. Uh, and then you can look at my book. I go into it extensively, uh, page 446 and footnote 76. Uh, some people might say, but actions speak louder than words, Eric. Come on. What is done is what is believed, right? Okay. Well, let's take that to the bank. What was done? The emperor of the Roman Empire rose up, threatened the entire Episcopal government of the church with exile being terminated from their job, and if they were lay people, they'd be banished from the realm if they did not sign the edict condemning the three chapters. And Justinian called the Ecumenical Council with Vigilius' consent at first, but did not abide by a freedom of dialogue that Vigilius wanted. Vigilius wanted more Western representation. And then Vigilius steamrolled his plan into the bishops. 
who are all frightened about what's going to happen if they go against him. So what's really done there? It's called Caesaropapism. So if what is done is what is faith, or the law of action is the law of faith, if you really want to be rigid with that, then we have to ratify Caesaropapism. But neither Orthodoxy, Catholicism, or Protestantism accepts that. So I'm one of those. I'm not a conciliar fundamentalist. This is a, one of those who would say, well, it's an ecumenical council. So it's obviously done, you know, everything it's done. Well, in its dogmatic utterances, yes, but not necessarily in the mannerisms of its procedure. There are some sine qua nons, but not in this case. In this case, this was completely done away with. We see it in the next century. I was we were reading from uh, Dr. Economou, how how did Maximus, the confessor, and Pope Martin and Theodore, they knew about this council, and yet they assembled the Lateran Synod, which went against the entire, uh, the whole monothelite imperial program, right? So Caesaropapism obviously wasn't the law of faith according to the saints. In fact, Maximus he he knew about this council in Constantinople 553, and look at his view of the papacy. So nothing about this event with Vigilius was a game changer for the saints. The papacy still continued on. People appealed to it, referred to its divine institution and its jurisdiction and infallibility. So forthcoming history from 553 seems to have annulled the entire event. In the next century, saints of both East and West are still lauding the inerrancy of Rome and the infallibility of the See of Peter. Besides the next council proclaiming that all of the Roman popes have been Orthodox up to the 7th century, we saw that in Agatho, remember? So Agatho made those claims. It's, it seems obvious to me that they looked back upon Vigilius and did not see a heretic. Okay. The Profoneticos of the Sixth General Council states that all prior councils, including the Fifth, were said to be all done in perfect harmony between emperor and pope. In other words, at the Council of Constantinople 681, they recount how each council was the product of cooperation between emperor and pope, which was a little bit of a historical revisionism. Yes, it was. Because, you know, they say Nicaea, was called by Sylvester and Constantine. Eh, we kind of know that didn't happen. Constantinople I was called by Damasus and Theodosius. Eh, we kind of know that didn't happen. The third ecumenical council of Ephesus was called by Celestine and uh, Theodosius II. Well, that's not really how it happened. Then he said the fourth ecumenical council was called by Leo and Marcion. That's a little bit more. You could kind of say that. Uh, but then it said for the Council of Constantinople 553 that Vigilius and Justinian were in perfect harmony over everything. And so, the, in other words, it gets lost. This whole thing of Vigilius being an episode against the papacy gets lost. Now, I still think it's a challenge to us. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we're that we don't need to think about this anymore. I think a whole book needs to be written on this. And I do think that we, and when it comes to apologetic argumentation, we are pulling off a Neo, you know, with a few of those bullets that are coming our way. Um, but I think we have an answer to Gavin's overall uh, statement on, you know, Vigilius and uh, the council. Also his statements about papal supremacy and infallibility over the general course of, of the first millennium. I think we talked about non-Catholic historians and theologians and Catholic historians and theologians that he deemed to be reliable. All of them are saying something much different than the first millennium was characteristic of a general Roman prominence, primacy of honor based upon factors that are accidental like being founded on the Roman imperial status of the, the Roman capital, Peter and Paul's 
accidental but moral excellency that kind of paved the way for Rome to be like a bastion, like the Mike Tyson of all the churches. You know, those are accidental motifs. They don't penetrate anywhere near the rationale that we reviewed here that was consistent. I'm done, Suan. Man, Eric, you did your homework. You, I mean, that was an excellent presentation. You're, you're really a world class scholar, Eric. Um, uh, oh man, I think I, I mean, I, you know, at first I wasn't going to do anything to be honest with you, but when you had, when you said, "Hey, I'd love to have you on," I said, "You know what? I'll throw the gloves on." <laughs> but again, to Gavin, this I, I even I sent him a message before. I said, "Hey, we're going to make a response. I want to make it in a way that's exemplary." That's uh, charitable and is with high respect to you. For those of you who are listening, I'm a fan of Dr. Gavin Orland. You can actually go to my channel, Classical Christian Thought. I did a whole uh, stream uh, talking about the virtues I see in him. Yeah, and I think, Eric, you exemplified that in your presentation. But I really do want to emphasize that, I mean, with all the work that you've done, with everything that you presented, I just don't think that you know, Catholics or really anybody who wants to move the ball forward in this debate. You know, I think that's something that Gavin's really interested in moving the dialogue, the ball forward. Right. Uh, I don't think we can just keep asserting anymore that uh, the claims of Vatican one uh, are totally novel, that they were just invented at the council in 1870, that they have no prior precedent or that they don't have robust prior precedent. The, the, the evidence is there. Vatican one is there in the first millennium. You have to deal with that fact somehow. Yeah. Now, that's that's the question. It's not if Vatican I is in the first millennium. It's that Vatican I is in the first millennium. How do you deal with it? Um, right. What are your thoughts on that, Eric? Yeah, I think I think I think that's where we need to all, you know, kind of like Chinese checkers, like the ball's got to fall in. We all need to fall into that concave hole where, OK, Vatican one is there in the first millennium. I don't believe it. I don't like it. I wish it wasn't there, sure. but it's there. Right. Um, and I have a theory that can account for that. I'm a Protestant. I can edit, revise and reinterpret history and, and sort of, you know, go back to the original source of scripture. Well, that might be a way to handle it, but let's not, you know, try to revise history to the point to the point where we're denying the facts, you know? Right. Yeah. And, and I think that if we deny that Vatican one was in the first millennium, then we're denying the facts um, as you've pointed out. Yeah. I, and, and as you did in the first five seconds of the show. <laughs> yeah. 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 With the, with the example, once again, for anybody watching, you know, whenever somebody quotes Vatican one pastor Turner saying it was known in every age that Peter rules through his successors, that's quoting Ephesus, uh, council of Ephesus 431 AD. If you're going to say that that, phrase that quote in vatican one that snippet counts as papal supremacy and fallibility then it had also better count in 431 a.d in the council of ephesus when it was stated by philip the roman legate so, and accepted by hundreds of bishops right and accepted by hundreds of bishops so i mean i just you know i don't know i don't know what you do with that anymore eric <laughs> right right i mean if i was a protestant i would just say yeah this is sure. true right. but yeah. we're, we're gonna work around it yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, man, Eric, you, you almost left me speechless. I don't know what to say anymore. But uh, Eric, thank you so much for your time and for everything that you've done. No, Such an honor to compliment. have you. Yeah, absolutely. It was a joy to come on. I was I was humbled when you asked me. I was like, oh, I get another opportunity to get on Suwon's channel. <laughs> Always. Yeah, Eric, uh, your work's greatly appreciated. Thank you.